Hallelujah. Come on, let's stand together. Amen. You are here. You're moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here. You're working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. Because you are way maker miracle worker promise keeper light in the darkness my god that is who you are you are way maker miracle worker promise keeper light in the darkness my god that is who you are you are he you're touching every heart. I worship you. I worship you. You are here. You're healing every heart. I worship you. I worship you. Because you are way maker miracle worker promise keeper light in the darkness my god that is who you are you are way maker miracle worker promise keeper light in the darkness my god that is who you are you are here you're turning lives around. I worship you. I worship you. You are here. You're mending every heart. I worship you. I worship you. Because you are way maker miracle worker promise keeper light in the darkness my god that is who you are you are way maker miracle worker promise keeper light in the darkness my god that is who you are 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 oh that is who you are that is who you are that is who you are oh that is who you are Cause even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Oh, that is who you are. That is who you are. That is who you are. Oh, that is who you are. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, 
holy are you, Lord, and holy are your ways. In reverence we come, in majesty you reign. So in this moment now, as heaven's drawing near, Lord, fill us with your power. Let us see your glory here. Our God is an all-consuming fire. 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 Worthy are you, Lord, and worthy of our praise. We're laying down our lives. We're lifting high your name. So in this moment now, where all in mercy me. God, let your fire fall, consume this offering. Thank you, Lord. And our God is an all-consuming fire. Our God is an all-consuming fire. Our God is an all-consuming fire. Consuming fire, you are holy. You are holy. Yeah. You are holy. And who is like you? There's no one like you. Our God is an all-consuming 
consuming fire. Oh, our God is an all consuming fire. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, from the darkness, I called your name. Into darkness, your mercy came. Yes, it did. You called me out, lifted me up. How great is your love. You bore my weakness, you took my shame. Buried my burdens in fields of grace. You called me out, lifted me up. How great is your love. From the heights of heaven, you stepped down to earth. Innocent perfection gave your life for us. We are amazed. Yes, we stand in awe, for we have been changed by the power of the cross. How great, how great, how great is your love. How great, how great, how great. your kindness you lead me home in your presence where I belong you called me out lifted me up how great is your love from the high of heaven, you step down to earth, innocent perfection, you gave your life for us, and we are amazed, oh, we stand in awe, for we have been changed by the power of the cross, how great, how great. A God like you, a love 
we do thank you, God. We thank you for your great love. We thank you for your mercy, your peace, your grace that you show us every day. Father, we've just come to just to be in your presence tonight, God. That's it. Wherever you are, God, that's where we want to be. Wherever you are, that's where we want to be. Lord, just draw us in tonight. Draw us in by your spirit. Lord, let us hear what the Spirit of God is speaking to the church tonight. Lord, we don't want to leave here the same way we came in. We want to be transformed by the renewing of our minds tonight. As the Word of God goes deep into our spirit and transforms us from the inside out. We want to leave here looking a little more like Jesus. So, Father, I praise you tonight for this opportunity to gather in your name. For it's in Christ's name we pray. And the church declares, amen and amen. Well, listen, do not be seated tonight. Do you greet some people and welcome them to the house of the Lord, amen? And welcome to all of you joining us online. God is good. Amen. Hey, uh, today is a very special lady's birthday. Today, the Revlo is celebrating the second anniversary of her 35th birthday today. And so we want to sing, uh, sing Revlo, our very special birthday song. Are you guys ready? Here we go. This is your birthday song. It isn't very long. Hey, happy birthday. Loretta. Whose anniversary is it today? The, oh, Kathy and Raleigh's? Uh, what is it, 187? How many years have you been married? Why are you, pu why are you pushing Raleigh to tell us? 54 glorious years. Glorious years. So congratulations, the Clarks. Well, we are, hey, just thank you to everybody that came out and helped with the uh, Back to School Bash. It went phenomenally well. We served over 112 students uh, in, Gibson, or in Gibson County. 
Uh, so that was really phenomenal. We're going to take what we have left. Uh, Mrs. Jordan from the school asked us to bring them out Monday for the open house. And so we're going to give out more supplies to families who maybe couldn't have made it that day. So, but just thank you to everybody that came to help. It was a fantastic day. Also, our fine arts team that's in Florida participated today. Uh, I know that the, the drama ensemble and the, uh, the children's lesson group uh, both got excellent scores. Uh, I didn't hear what Lydia's score was yet on her singing, but I heard that Miss Geneva's artwork got perfect scores. Yeah. So I know she gets all that from Cindy. So right, Chad? Let's get all that. Chad and I are at home holding down the forts this week. I've lost 18 pounds. No, <laughs> I've been eating Cheerios and uh, chicken nuggets all week long. No, I'm just teasing. But what's that? Oh, they're oh, you got they're gone. That's all he's eating this week is cookies, no doubt. Well, if you got your Bibles tonight, turn to the book of James, chapter four. Uh, verses 13 through 17. We're continuing our study of the book of James. This series is entitled Everyday Faith. And tonight's message is called Trusting God with Our Tomorrow. Trusting God with Our Tomorrow. Hey, this past weekend, we had another couple in church celebrating an anniversary. Cal and Amanda Toth uh, were out celebrating their anniversary this last week. And so uh, they have uh, not been married 54 glorious years, but uh, how many was it? Five? What's it? Five, yeah. Five, gl five glorious years. It doesn't sound as impressive as 54, so... <laughs> They'll get there. They'll get there. How old will you be uh, in 40? Yeah, we celebrate the small ones because by the time you That's right. <laughs> 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 All right, James chapter 4, 13 through 17. My wife's probably watching online going, move on, move on. <laughs> it says, look here, you who say today or tomorrow we are going to a certain town and we'll stay there a year. We will do business there and make a profit. How do you know what your life will be like tomorrow? Your life is like the morning fog. It's here for a little while, and then it's gone. What you ought to say is, if the Lord wants us to, we will live and do this or that. Otherwise, you are boasting about your own pretentious plans, and all such boasting is evil. Remember, it is a sin to know what you ought to do and then not do it. Father, I want to thank you tonight for the word of God. May our hearts be open as a fertile field to receive the word so that a harvest of righteousness can come in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, it is estimated, I thought this was a huge number, but it's estimated that the average adult makes 35,000 decisions a day. 35, that's, that's and, and so if you think about that, 35,000 decisions. So, I mean, I mean, I guess that's everything. Like, what you're going to wear, if you're going to get a drink of water. I mean, you make 35,000 decisions a day. But I, for one, certainly, yeah, no wonder we're tired. <laughs> I, for one, certainly do not consult God in regards to every one of those decisions. But it does make me wonder this. How comfortable have I become with decisions without consulting God? How comfortable have I become with making decisions without consulting God? You know, we certainly do not have enough time in the day to consult God on every decision that we make, nor do I think God would want us to squander our days asking His direction on things that, one, are carnal in nature. You know, every day I have a conversation at the freezer with Cohen and after his nap. He gets up from his nap, he comes to the freezer, and I'm like, do you want a red, orange, or red popsicle? You wouldn't think that it's a life-changing decision, but it takes 20 minutes for him to decide which one of the popsicles. You know, I, we don't go to the Lord in prayer, me and Cohen. We don't kneel down next to the refrigerator and pray for God's direction on whether red, orange, or purple is the way to go that day, right? So there's decisions that we make that are carnal in nature that God does not intend for us to ask him about. We also make what I call remotely conscious decisions, right? When I get up in the morning and I'm thirsty, 
I go to the, I go to, I just go to the faucet and I take a drink. It doesn't really feel like a decision to me, but remotely, consciously, I'm making a, a decision. So God doesn't anticipate me going to prayer about that. He also doesn't expect me, now listen to this, he doesn't need me to ask direction on things that are clearly defined in God's word. How many times do we spend asking God about things that are already made clear to us in the word of God? How many know God doesn't change his mind based on your circumstance? If the Bible says do not steal, it means do not steal. And the circumstance doesn't matter. So God doesn't need us to consult him when it comes to things that are clearly defined in Scripture. This massive quantity of what we call everyday's decisions, however, can swallow up the important decisions that we need to make where consulting God would be beneficial to us. And here's a statement. I just want you to get this. The more decisions we make without consulting God the more self-confident we become in our own ability to make decisions. There it is. (laughs) The more decisions we make without consulting God, the more self-confident we become in our own ability to make decisions. So the more decisions that we make, and I'm talking about these everyday decisions, 35,000 decisions that I make in a day, I may not need to consult God on all of those, but what happens is as I make more and more decisions in my own life without consulting God, I get self-confident in my ability to make decisions without consulting God. And that can turn out to haunt us. You see, making decisions without consulting God soon turns into making plans that exclude him as well. Okay, we, It starts with making decisions without consulting God. But when we become confident in our own decision making, soon we begin to determine whether or not the plans that we, we start making our own plans. If I can make decisions on my own without God, I can make plans on my own without God as well. Woody Allen said, if you want to make God laugh, tell him your plans, right? I don't, Woody Allen's not a great theologian, but he does, make a, he does make a point, right? You know, who quotes Woody Allen at church? But, but isn't it true, though? But it's true. If you want to make God laugh, tell him your plans. The truth is, you can make all the plans in the world, but your plans will never trump God's purpose. Listen to that again. You can make all the plans in the world, but your plans will never trump God's purpose. Proverbs 19, 21 confirms this. He says, you can make many plans, but the Lord's purpose will prevail. I mean, you can have exhaustive plans. You can have detailed plans. But if it is a plan that you have made that is outside the scope and will of God, then it may not prevail because only the Lord's purpose will will prevail. See, God has a plan and a purpose for your life. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, for I know the plans that I have for you. How many know that God has a plan for you? Every single person in this room, you go, oh, I don't think he's got a plan for me. He has a plan for you. Jeremiah 29, 11 confirms this. I have a plan for you, says the Lord. They are plans for what? Good, not disaster, to give you a future and a hope. How many know that plans that are good, that have a future and a hope, how many want plans like that? Okay? So here becomes the statement. God has plans for each and every one of us. So when, and I want you to read this next statement with me. So when we make determinations without consulting God, we could be taking needless detours that will only prolong us reaching the preferred future that God intends for us. Did you know that God has, there, you have a preferred future. It's God's future for you. God has a plan for your life. Our job isn't to plan out our life. The, the purpose of our life is to discover the plan that God has for us. God has a plan for you and a future and a hope for you. And so I don't have to plan out my future as much as I need to get into the will of God and let him reveal to me what his future is. Through these open doors and different things that God does. In order to do that, we have to get our will out of the way of God's will. The biggest obstacle to the will of God in your life is your own personal will. It is the biggest obstacle that you have to get past. 
You say, well, so-and-so held me back, so-and-so said this. You know, we have all of these kind of situations where God, you know, we feel like other people are keeping us from the will of God, but the greatest enemy to the will of God in your life is the person you face in the mirror every day. It's your own personal will. And notice what in James 4.13 it says. He says, look here, you who say, today or tomorrow, we are going to take, we are going to a certain town and we'll stay there a year. We will do business there and make a profit. Listen to what, again, what, the, what James is saying. This individual said, we are going to do this. We will stay there for a certain amount of time. We will do business and we will make a profit. You hear that? We will go. We will stay. We will do business. We will make a profit. It is all about what our will is in that situation. Again, we see how easy it is to place our plans ahead of God's purpose, right? So is it, is it, is it, does it mean we shouldn't have dreams and aspirations? I'm not saying that. We're going to get to that here in just a minute. The idea is, though, is that we've stopped consulting God about what his plans are for our life and instead substituted what we want to see happen in hopes that it'll line up with what God has already planned out for us. That's where we begin to struggle. That's where there's so much frustration in people's lives. Why isn't God moving in my life? Why isn't God doing this? Well, are you moving down a path without consulting God? Was that your plan or was that his plan? If it was not his plan, then maybe you need to consult God on whether or not you should be moving forward with that relationship, with that job offer, whatever it is, moving from your house to another house. All these big decisions that we make, are we asking God whether or not this is his will for our lives? Or are we saying, this seems like a good idea. Oh, a pay increase? Surely that's the will of God for me, to take that job because there's a pay increase involved. That's not necessarily true. Maybe God is going to bless you that way, but maybe that's not the motive for pursuing that position. Notice, we become, and I want to, I want to say this, I had to ask Alex how to, how to spell this word, because, and I had it right, but I had to still ask a college kid to make sure I spelled it right. We become presumptuous in our planning because we assume that God's leniency is an indication of his approval. Okay? We become presumptuous in our planning because we assume that God's leniency is an indication of his approval and his will. Because God didn't stop me from buying that house, He didn't stop me from buying that $80,000 car. He didn't stop me from marrying that person that I knew was toxic in my life. Because we think that leniency is God's approval. But yet the problem did not stop with what God allowed us to do. The problem was we didn't consult God on whether or not we should do it to begin with. Because sometimes I believe that God allows us to make dumb decisions. And we will have to go on detours. Remember, God's purpose will prevail, but how quickly you get to God's purpose is completely dependent on your decision making. Because if you make poor decisions without consulting God, you may get there, but you may have to go to Albuquerque in order to get to Florida. Because you're making these poor decisions all the way around to get to the purpose and plan of God. You see, James 4.14 says, how do you know... What your life will be tomorrow. See, here's, he's talking about we're making presumptions. We're assuming things that we've got tomorrow. He says, your life is like the morning fog. It's here a little while, and then it's gone. You know, that's real encouraging. But James is trying to be realistic with all of us, is that we're not promised tomorrow. We're not promised tomorrow. I was reading just on Facebook today about one of the congresswomen from our state that was killed in an automobile accident. She was friends with some of my pastor friends up north. You know, tragic, just out of the blue, her and a couple of young people that were with her uh, were killed tragically today. She, you know, you would think to yourself, this lady had everything before her, but yet today was her day. Today was her day. 
None of us are promised tomorrow. So we make presumptions. Oh, I'm going to do this in life. I'm going to do that in life. I'm going to go here. I'm going to do there. I'm going to live this way. I'm going to marry this person. I'm going to do all these things without once consulting the Lord about what is your plan for me in my life. Do you have a statement, Jim? Yes, it is. You know, I, I think about Jesus. If there was anybody that I think could be presumptuous when it comes to making decisions, because, I mean, he's the son of God, right? Surely he can maybe take a little more liberty than most of us can because of his relationship with the Father, but even Jesus wasn't so presumptuous to think that his relationship with God would override the Father's prevailing will for his life, right? Let me say it again. Even Jesus wasn't so presumptuous to think that his relationship with God would override the Father's prevailing will for his life. Nowhere do we see that more clearly than in the Garden of Gethsemane. Nowhere do we see it. Jesus expressed his will. He did. He expressed his will in the garden, but he submitted himself to the Father's will. In Matthew 26, 39, it says that he went on a little farther. Remember, he's, he's praying in the garden. His disciples went with him. Uh, he prays for a little while. They fall asleep. He wakes them up, you know, but he's pressing in. Jesus is continuing to press in and pray at the mountain. And, he, and when he was up there, he went a little farther. He bowed his face to the ground, and he said, My father, if it is possible, let this cup of suffering be taken away from me. How I many know that's his will? That's his express, that's Jesus' express will. If it is possible, if there's another way, listen, could you not maybe do an end run? Maybe, you know, listen, I'm your son. Maybe there's another way that we can do this. Jesus expressed his will if it's possible to let this cup pass. But then he's, the, the statement he makes next is what solidifies what we're talking about. He says, yet I want your will to be done, not mine. He want, and this is his will to be done in Jesus' life, you know, sometimes we have to go to the cross to actually accomplish the will of God. That is not, again, that's one of those Jesus said what statements. Because honestly, Jesus had to go to the cross to accomplish the will of God for his life. Following Jesus is not easy. That's why we have to count the cost. That's why I got to make sure we understand we're going to forsake everything to follow him. That's the point that James is just driving home is that because in, in my perfect world, in, in Scott Burr's will, he's got a preferred future that he planned out that has nothing to do with going to a cross. <laughs> it has nothing to do with being martyred for my faith. It doesn't have, I mean, in my preferred future that I wrote the, the script for myself, none of that is in there. But there comes a point in time where I reach that point, and, and, and Jesus says, this is my plan for your life. It is either forsake God or to say, it's not my will, but your will be done. John the Baptist made the declaration. He said, Jesus must increase, and I must decrease. You see the pattern? There's a pattern in Scripture, even within Jesus' own life. You know, that's why in James 4.15, James wrote, You ought to say, if the Lord wants us to, we will live and do this or that. If the Lord wants us to. One of the things I always get a kick out of when I talk to my friend Roger Tab, Pastor Tab, Brother Tab, that's what I call him, Brother Tab, uh, is we'll ta be talking on the phone and and, uh, and I said, all right, brother. I said, I love you. I'll see you later. And he said, Lord willing. He always says, Lord, always. He says, it, he goes, Lord willing. Lord willing. Because he says, I don't, I mean, because he understands this. He does you don't know. He, you know, I'll see you later. May, well, yeah, maybe in heaven, but maybe not here on earth. You know, that his, he, he's got a firm grasp of this idea that his will, that his will comes, is subservient to the will of God. It's subservient to it. Is that I, I, I'm I, right now in my life, and it's and it's interesting because later in my life I'm discovering I'm trying to discover what the will of God is for my life. I've been living in the will of God, but it's like I'm stumbling upon it as I go. Anybody ever feel like that? 
You know, I'm just, I'm, I'm figuring it out as, a, you know, God says, take this step and I take it, take that step and I take it. You know, there wasn't a time when I, if I look back on my, even my ministry career, that where I am today, I had no idea, no plans of, of where I would be. At least, I mean, it, what God's preferred future was, I learned, is I just got to understand that God has a plan for my life, and sometimes he only reveals that plan one step at a time. And nobody likes that. Nobody likes the one step at a time uh, revealing of God's plan for your life. But I think about the Apostle Paul. Remember the Apostle Paul. Uh, God had told, when, he went to, uh, when God showed up in Ananias' dream and said, I'm sending Paul, he said, he goes, you mean the guy that's persecuting everybody? And he says, but he, he makes the statement, he goes, I already showed Paul everything he must suffer to follow me. And I've often thought to myself, how many of us in this room would follow Jesus if we got a Cliff Notes version of what our life was going to look like? The beatings, the shipwrecks, the, the left for deads, the being hungry and destitute, the people hating you when you go in places. I mean, if we got it and they said, here's your ministry career, I'm going to give you a little glimpse of it before you get started, yes or no? To me, it's impressive that Paul said, Yes. We don't get to see that, but we know, and everybody in this room has to know, it's a possibility that the plan for our life on earth may glorify God, but not look anything like the preferred future we had planned for ourselves, but, it, we, but it, the Lord's will will prevail. The question is, do we trust the plan and purpose God has for our life is better than the plans that we have made? Can we trust God with our tomorrow? Can we trust him with our tomorrow? We have to. We have to. In Psalm 33, 4, it says, for the, Lord, for the word of the Lord holds true, and we can trust everything that he does. Do you believe that? Well, I believe it for your life, Pastor. I don't necessarily believe it for my life. Listen, you have to believe it. It says right there, you trust everything that he does, every decision that he makes. Every, his preferred future for you is better than any preferred future you can plan for yourself. It's better. In fact, Romans 8.28 tells us, and we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God, notice this, and are called according to his purpose for them. He's got a purpose for you. Have you thought about what is that purpose? A lot of times, it'd be, I, think it's, I think of it more like this. We want God to reveal his purpose to us. But we don't want to actually discover his purpose for us. You say, what's the difference? Because we want it easy. We just want to sit there and God show us, this is my plan and purpose for your life, while we sit and read it like we're being entertained in a book. Where God says, I want you to go out and live by faith, and as you're living by faith, I'm going to reveal my purpose in your life, step by step. As you demonstrate faith, I'm going to demonstrate my faithfulness towards you. And I'm going to reveal my plan. I'm going to reveal my purpose. And I'm going to show it to you as you're, as you're taking those steps of faith, as you're moving along, as you're growing and maturing in Christ, you're going to learn about who you are and what God has called you to. The beautiful thing is, is that when I, when I, if I, I should say this, if I wake up tomorrow, Lord willing, that there is, a, that what I understand is there is a preferred future that God has for me. And he's not done with me yet. Every day that I wake up with breath in my body, there is a preferred future that's ahead of me. You know that? Every day, every single day. When you wake up in the morning, you should be excited about the fact that there is a preferred future ahead of you, that God has a plan and a purpose for your life, and he's going to make all things work together for the good of those who love him, who, according to his purpose for them. That's powerful. That should strengthen us every single day. You say, but I hate my job right? I hate, I hate going to work every day. I hate the people that are around me. And listen, you need to be not thinking about your, the externals that are surrounding you. You need to think about the preferred future for your life. Where you are is a stepping stone to where God has you going. If you're consulting God, so let's back up. Here's the question, right? 
first, how do we trust God with our tomorrow? Two things. The first thing, how do we trust the Lord? How, the first thing we do, how do we trust God with our tomorrow? First, we have to trust the Lord with all of our heart. Proverbs 3, 5 through 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. We spend 90% of our days depending on our own understanding. Maybe 99.9% .9 of our day depending on our own understanding. Seek what? Whose will? His will. In all that you do, and he will show you which path to take. How many times have you come up on a path to go left or to go right, and rather than consult the Lord, you uh, put out a pro and con list and tried to figure it out yourself? And then how many times did you take the path that you thought was right, and then it ended up not being the right path to, be, to begin with? Because we didn't lean on his understanding, we le leaned on our own understanding. And we took a wrong path. He will direct your path. What I found in life is that when God does not want me, when I begin to consult him about something, is that you know, there was opportunities throughout the years where, where ministry opportunities had come for me. You know, they, they, people had asked me, would you come do this? Would you come do that? And, and I, had, I went to the Lord. And I prayed. And what happened is he got shut the door. He said, that's not the path for you. You're on the path that I want you on. This is your preferred future right now. Stay the path. Stay the course. You know, I was talking to, uh, I was having a dinner last night with Pastor Jonathan Miller. We were talking about ministry, and his dad's been a minister for years, and I'd asked him, I said, how many, what's the longest tenure he'd been at some place? And I think he said like six years in one location. And there are pastors out there who, who are called to go into hurting churches and bring health and life, and then God moves them on. So a lot of times when we're at these uh, legacy events with pastors who have pastored for 50 years, you know, they'll have pastored five five, six, seven churches over the course of their ministry career. And, uh, and I, 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 we, as we were talking, I said, I, found, I find people who do that fascinating to me. I said, because I've been at the same church my pastoral career, my, all 20, you know, 22 years, my whole pastoral ministry has been in the same place. And it was funny, Jonathan said to me, he goes, yeah, but the families that have had to move envy you that have been in one place for so long. You see, but that was God's preferred future for me, was to be here, and not to be here and go, but to be here and to stay, and everything else that God did around me during these years was part of that. You know, one of the things that God shared with me years ago, he said, Scott, anything that you want to accomplish, you can accomplish from Owensville. He said, I'll make it happen. Whether it's leadership in, the, in our district, whether it's writing the book, or, you know, whatever it is, whatever it is that you, it's in your heart to accomplish, if you will stay the course, you will stay where I've got you planted right now, you'll be able to accomplish all those things. And you know what? That's exactly what happened. That's exactly what happened. Because here's the next part. This is number two. The second thing is we have to commit our actions to him. You got to commit your heart to him, right? But then you got to commit your actions to him. In Proverbs 16, 3, it says, commit your actions to the Lord and your plans will succeed. You say, well, you just said we shouldn't have plans. Listen to that statement again, right? You commit your actions to the Lord and your plans will succeed. If those plans line with, the, with God's plan for your life, they're going to succeed. If you commit your actions to the Lord and they don't line up with God's preferred future for you, then they won't succeed. But you got to commit those actions. And I'm not talking the everyday, you know, I know we talk about, uh, you know, we talked about those 35,000 decisions that we make every single day. Yeah, we don't go to the Lord with all 35,000. But I'm pretty sure that every one of us in this room know and understand the decisions that come across our, our lives that we should stop and consult God. Like I said, he doesn't care what color popsicle Cohen has. He doesn't. But he does care about, he's got, Cohen's got a preferred future ahead of him. And there are going to be important milestones in his life where he's got to make a decision to follow Christ. How many know that's an important one? He's going to have to decide one day maybe where to go to school or go to work or who to marry. He's going to have to decide whether he's going to pursue ministry or pursue a career, whatever God would have for him. And he is going to have to pray, and he is going to have to seek God and trust God with all of his heart that God cares more about his tomorrow than even you do. You know, I used to worry about my kids all the time. 
you know, about what their future would be like. And, and God just told me one day in prayer, he said, listen, believe it or not, I love your kids more than you love your kids. And I argued with him for like 20 minutes. I said, no, you don't. And he's like, yes, I do. And I was like, no, you don't. And I mean, literally for like 20 minutes, me and God having this conversation. And he says, I love your kids more than you love your kids. And he says, and honestly, he goes, you have planned a path. You have laid a path for your kids to have a life of faith moving forward. But even the plan that you have provided for them to follow doesn't compare to the plan that I have already prepared in advance for them. I've got to trust God with my kids. He has a preferred future for them that's greater than any future I could wish for them. I got to trust God with them. I got to trust him with all of my heart. I can't lean on my own understanding. I got to seek his will in everything that I do, and then he'll show me the right way to go. I got to commit my actions. So it's not I'm just talking words, but I'm living my life. I'm making sure I'm making determinations that are going to bring me in to the will of God. So let's go back to that initial passage, if you would, guys, take us back to James 4, 13 through 17. Look here, you who say today or tomorrow, we are going to a certain town and we'll stay there a year. We will do business there and make a profit. How do you know what your life will be like tomorrow? We got to trust. You know who does know what your tomorrow is like? I don't know what your tomorrow is, but I know who does. That's why I trust God. I know God knows my tomorrow. He knows all of my tomorrows. And that way I can trust him in the midst of whatever I'm walking through, that tomorrow God is already there. In fact, the Bible says his name is Jehovah Shammah. The Lord is there. Whatever situation is coming in my life, the Lord is there. I have a friend of mine who had cancer that she overcame, and recently she found out that it was back. And she was shook by it. But you know who wasn't shook by it? God. Because Jehovah Shammah already knew. He had already been providing her with a, a, another set of doctors because the last set that she said she had didn't really, she didn't get a lot of hope from talking to them about this. So they found another set of doctors and the first day she met with him, they infused her with hope. They said, there, we think that you can beat it again. Listen, that, God knew that. God knew that in advance that he had already prepared this situation. He had gone out ahead of her into this battle and had already set up things. That's what I love about God. God knows what you're going to face before you face it. And he prepares the place ahead of you so that when you get there, you're not walking in and going, where is God? God has already been there preparing the situation in his presence for you to arrive. How powerful is that? He is Jehovah Shammah. The Lord is there. He says, how do you know that your life will be like tomorrow? Your life is like the morning fog. It's here a little while, then it's gone. You ought to say, if the Lord wants us to, we will live and do this or that. That is a declaration of faith. What the Lord wants, the Lord wants us to, we will live and do. And that should be a confession of your mouth. What the Lord wants, I'll live and do. What the Lord wants, I'll live and do. Well, what do you want? Well, I have, my, I have some plans, right? I got some things in my heart and in my mind. I got some dreams, some aspirations, things for my kids, things for myself. But at the end of the day, I will do what the Lord says. I will submit my will to his will, my plans to his plans, my goals for his goals. You say, well, that, that sound, that, that, I don't know if I like that or not. I'm telling you what we read at the very beginning, that God has a plan for you that is greater for your life than anything that you could dream up yourself. He's already planned it. It is a place for good. It's a place for hope. It's a place for the future. Notice verse 16. And then I'm going to close out with these last two verses. He says, otherwise, you are boasting about your own pretentious plans. And all such boasting is evil. Verse 17. This is kind of a go-to passage for me because it covers such a broad spectrum. But he says, but as he closes this, he says, remember, it is a sin to know what you ought to do and then do not do it. Uh, now, you got to think about that in correlation to the will of God. It's a sin to know the will of God and not do the will of God. 
It's a sin to know it and not do it. And we should be convicted by that. It's, sin, it's a sin to know what you ought to do and then not do it. You know, and, and that comes down to the smallest of things. Somebody standing on a street corner with a sign that says, need food. And you feel in your spirit you're supposed to and you know you ought to, but you don't do it. That was a sin. You say, well, no, I was just stewarding my money. No, you weren't. You were being disobedient to the Holy Spirit that was telling you to help in that situation. You know, we, when we're, we're listening to the Holy Spirit, how many of us in this room, and we're not raising hands because we'll all be raising hands, are guilty of this right here? Knowing what we ought to know, it is a sin to know what you ought to do and then not do it. You don't need a laundry list of things. You know, a lot of people say, well, you got the Ten Commandments, it's just a list of, of don'ts that, you know, that it's self imposed on the church by God and all of these things. Listen, all you need is this one verse. If you know the good you ought to do and don't do it, you're sinning. <laughs> That's all you really need to know in life. Is that if you know you should do it, you know it's right, you know it's good, you ought to do it. And if not, then you're falling short. So as we close our time tonight, the, you know, the question becomes, are we trusting God with our tomorrow? Are you trusting Him with your tomorrow? It's important because you have a preferred future. How many people in this room have a preferred future that God has planned for your life? Uh, if you're not raising your hand, you're a liar. Because I just told you tonight, you have a preferred future. How many of you, uh, and this is funny, by a show of hands, have a preferred future for your life that you planned? Right? I think probably all of us in this room. How many of you have rewritten that story multiple times over the course of your life? Right? He's like, well, that preferred future didn't turn out the way I thought it was. I'm going to rewrite chapter 2, preferred future chapter 2. And we, we rewrite and rewrite. You know, God only had to write it one time. He's never had to change it. All we have to do is discover what it is through living in obedience to his word. Amen? Yeah. Hey, let's close in prayer, and then we'll take questions. Father, I just want to thank you tonight in Jesus' name for your word. I want to thank you, God. We can trust you with our tomorrow. Lord, you love my family more than I do. I trust them to you. I trust my life to you. That even though I might have plans, Lord, your purpose will prevail. Lord, I want your plan and purpose for my life. And so, Lord, I'm asking that for everyone watching tonight online, everyone who's seated in the sanctuary tonight, that God, listen, that you would reveal your preferred plan for our life, but do it in such a way, God, as we are walking in it, not just showing it to us. I think that might scare some people away. But, Father, as you reveal it one step at a time, God, people are going to begin to walk in the divine destiny that you have for them. Lord, I just thank you tonight for your word. And I praise you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. <laughs> that was my other grandchild making noise back there.